Welcome to the special edition of Question Time on Afghanistan. On tonight's panel, James Cleverly, Foreign Office Minister for the Middle East and North Africa, former chair of the Conservative Party and a Lieutenant Colonel in the Territorial Army. Labour's Shadow Foreign Secretary, previously a member of both Jeremy Corbyn and Ed Miliband's front bench teams, Lisa Nandy. Rory Stewart, former mm. diplomat and author, previously International Development Secretary and candidate for the leadership of the Conservative Party, from which he has since resigned. He lived and worked in Kabul for three years from 2005 and has travelled across the country. Nelifor Hadayat, journalist, documentary filmmaker and former Newsround presenter, she came to Britain as a child refugee from Afghanistan in 1994. And joining us down the line from Washington DC, Mehdi Hassan, formerly a journalist in Britain, also a presenter for Al Jazeera. He now presents his own political talk show on the US TV channel, MSNBC. Good evening, welcome to our panel here in the studio. Welcome to Mehdi, who joins us down the line from Washington DC. Good to see you and welcome to our audience, our first live audience for Question Time since the pandemic started. A bit smaller than we've had in the past, but very good to see you all. And of course, welcome to you at home. Thank you so much for joining us and for watching. And if you want to join in the debate, you can in the usual way on social media at BBC Question Time. And let's hear what you've got to say on this very important topic. Right, our first question tonight is from Rita Banj. Hello, panel. We had an entry strategy to fight war in Afghanistan, so why have we failed on the exit strategy? James Cleverly. Well, uh, thank you. And, and, and as you say, there was a, a very clear imperative for uh, the West, for NATO, to initiate the action in Afghanistan. Uh, the attacks on the World Trade Centers were devastating. British people lost their lives, of course, as well as the Americans, and Al-Qaeda was being harbored in Afghanistan. So the initial entry was to uh, prevent Al-Qaeda from using Afghanistan as a base of operations. And that initial mission was a success. So why have and we failed the on the last, exit and over strategy? The last That's Rita's years, question. And over the last 20 years, there have been no successful terrorist attacks emanating from Afghanistan. We then chose collectively to also seek to bring about a positive change in Afghanistan, support women's emancipation, education, uh, the implementation uh, James, of James, the question is why have we failed on the exit strategy? Uh, to implement democracy. And that has proven to be a much, much harder uh, proposition. The British... Uh, position had always been that we wanted to have an exit based on certain criteria, certain conditions that had been met. And do you think the that's American happened? The American administration obviously felt that they wanted to, to leave uh, within a particular time frame. Um, and we've now seen that there has been, both from the Trump administration and the Biden administration, uh, a delivery on that American domestic uh, uh, American uh, decision. And we've, we're now seeing the ripple effects from that. There's still work to do. We need to uh, make sure that we embed the successes that we have had, and there have been some successes. Uh, and we also need to make sure that Afghanistan doesn't once again become the place where terrorist attacks emanate. Rory. Well, the, the reason why it failed is that it was reckless, shameful. Essentially, the entire Afghan Air Force was destroyed as we left, and the American forces left in the middle of the night. But the big question is, why were we pushing for the exit at all? In South Korea, the United States has been there for 70 years. They've got 25,000 troops there. If they'd left after 20 years, they would have left at a time when South Korea had a GDP per capita lower than the Congo in a military dictatorship. If you're going to get involved, get involved patiently. And we had a light footprint of 2,500 American, British, and other soldiers that could have remained there with very few casualties at low cost. This was an unnecessary, reckless defeat. Let's hear from the woman in the front here. Um, my question is to James. You said to implement democracy. I think the two are like contrasting things. How can you peacefully implement democracy? All right. Well, there is definitely a demand for democracy. We've seen this. There, uh, 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 I think a quarter of From the, the members people. of uh, a quarter of the members of the lawyer Jerga, the 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 Afghanistan Parliament, were women. There has been a there is a real demand. There has been a real demand. But for women's meaningful by whom? participation this is, this is what's always been difficult in, for people to understand. By and we whom? were there to support that. James, Sorry. by whom? The problem is, is when we talk about Afghanistan, we talk 
to Afghans, we talk at mm -hmm. Afghans, we never talk with them. I watch Tolo news, I watch the news that, that comes out of Afghanistan made by the people that consume it, that's about the land that they're from. And I promise you, democracy was forced onto them. You mentioned very, a moment ago, that success was achieved and that terrorism, uh, the threat of it was removed for a time, was. We're back in that frame now. And that's exactly what we've done with this foolhardy attempt at, at withdrawing a, a, a troop, um, a, an offensive that, that could have been stopped by the Taliban does not need more troops on the ground, but it needs a commitment from the Western forces, and that's what we've been lacking. And, and you have family there still, I think. Absolutely. What are you hearing from family and friends? Look, th these aren't just faces that we see on TV when we're watching the news at 10. These are, these are my family, these are my friends. My uncle is still in Afghanistan, staying put, being told not to move for fear of being caught by the Taliban. I made a documentary on the BBC 10 years ago with my family who talked in, in really negative terms about what the Taliban were. My, my auntie out there is a teacher of a girls' school and we've just left them holding the hot potato. We've left them to deal with, <coughs> with a group that over the last 20 years have become calculating, have become smart, have decided and know how to work the propaganda game. This Taliban 2.0 is a propaganda scheme and it's something that the rest of the world is watching unfold whilst the Afghan people are yet again left holding the bar. The man in the brown shirt. The exit was an American unilateral decision. So are we powerless or do we choose to follow blindly? All right, I'm going to go around the audience a little bit and then we'll come back. The woman at the back there. I don't actually think, James, that you answered the question. The question was, what was the exit strategy? You clearly haven't answered that question. It seems to me there was no exit strategy that had any mindful um, bearing on what the Afghan people actually wanted or needed. I'll come back to you on that, James, in a moment. The man in the pink shirt. Going back to the point about democracy, does Afghanistan have an appetite for democracy? Does it work out there? Can it fit in? Ap Afghanistan has an appetite for freedom, for justice, for fairness, for equality, for acceptance, all the things that everyone in this room recognises. Lisa, let me come to you. Rita's question is, we had an entry strategy to fight the war in Afghanistan. Why have we failed on the exit strategy? Well, I think first to acknowledge that the entry strategy was flawed as well. It was absolutely right, as James said, after the 9-11 attacks for the UK to want to respect that Article um, 5 of the NATO agreement had been invoked, that we have a, a duty to come to the mutual aid of NATO member states, that British citizens had been some of the, uh, the second biggest uh, victims of the 9-11 attacks outside of the United States, and that there was a real need to degrade the capability of Al-Qaeda. But those decisions were flawed in that there was no real understanding of the complexity of what then had to come <coughs> next. And so this has long and deep roots, and there have been a series of political and strategic failures over a very long period of time that led to here. By but to answer your question, Darren, both on the left and the right, sure. and that's really and, important and, and to on mention. Both, and that, on both that, sides that the, of the Atlantic, I absolutely accept that, and I think it's really important to have a level of humility about that. But so where, to do you your see, question, where do you see your Labour's question, failings then in this issue? Well, I mean, the decision to go in in the first place was taken when George Bush was in power on one side of the Atlantic and Labour was in power on the other. And, the, you know, there are lessons that we are going to have to learn about the last 20 years in Afghanistan, and we shouldn't shy away from learning those lessons about the role that my party played, just as we shouldn't shy away from learning the lessons that James's party has played as well. But to answer your question very directly, the, the, what we've seen unfold in the last few months was not inevitable. It was a consequence, as Rory said, of the decision by the United States to withdraw, which left the UK in a difficult position, and I acknowledge and respect that. The decision by Joe Biden to put a firm end date on, on the withdrawal obviously helped to motivate the Taliban and give them the, a signal that they could advance across the country. It had a huge impact on the morale of the Afghan forces as well and really undermined the efforts that had been made to try to strengthen their resilience. But if I could just say this too, our government had 18 months to prepare. 18 months ago in Doha, there was an agreement that the US would be leaving and Joe Biden has always made clear that he would respect that agreement. To see these scenes at the airport, to see the Defence Secretary saying that now because of our failure to plan, people will be left behind and they will die, 
This is unacceptable and it is an unparalleled moment of shame for this government. Maybe let's hear from you. Let's hear the view from Washington. I think the answer to the question, why was there no exit strategy, is because we were lied to. I mean, we were lied to from the very beginning. We were, we were always told that Afghanistan was the good war and Iraq was the bad war. But you know what? Afghanistan had its own share of lies. We were told there was no alternative to going to war, even though it was reported at the time the Taliban were willing to hand over bin Laden to a third country. If Bush offered proof, Bush said no. The Taliban in December 2001 offered to surrender as long as their leaders were kept safe in Kandahar. Donald Rumsfeld said no, unconditional surrender. How did that work out? For 20 years, Obama, Trump, Blair, Brown, Camp, May, Johnson, they all lied to us. 20 years, we're turning the corner. We're going to win. It's going well. Democracy's coming. The Taliban are on the run. And what do we get for 20 years? What do we get? 457 UK dead, 2,448 American dead, 47,000 dead Afghan civilians, 69,000 dead Afghan soldiers and police officers. At what point do we say enough is enough? We have to end this, even if it's done, and I think it was done in a horrific way, but it has to end. I don't accept Rory's analogy. South Korea, we have not been facing a 20-year armed insurgency American. Mary, you're South completely... Korea. Mary, we cannot have an endless war, Rory. You, and, you know, you're Einstein totally... Mary, you're, big, you're, ma mass, you're talking doing about... the same thing over and over again and expecting different you, results. You're, you're massively misrepresenting the situation. Combat operations finished in 2014. You're living in the past. There have been very few US or UK casualties. This is one of the problems with the line that Biden think that is selling. Is, and yet, Since 2014. Why do you think that is, Rory? Since 2014, because, why do you think that we, is? because we were conducting, since 2014, air operations from bases in support of the Afghan National Army. There was no significant pressure against our forces on the ground. They were never tested. This idea that Biden Rory. is selling and that you are trying to sell that we were still stuck in the middle of a bloody civil war and we had no alternative other than to leave is totally false to the millions Hold of on. Afghans, the millions no. of Afghans whose lives have been improving over the last few years. You're much too pessimistic about what's been happening in Kabul. I don't know when you were last right. there, maybe. When were you last in Kabul? When I was there in November, I'm, I'm I not could, in Kabul. When I was when I was there in November, I can assure you the people that I've been working with okay. for 20 years are in a much better respond? situation than they were before. Okay. And you're let's, dismissing let's hear, all let's those Let's hear a response from Mehdi. Well, first of all, the last US soldier died in February 2020. Do you know what happened in February 2020? Donald Trump signed a withdrawal agreement with the Taliban. So this idea that we could stay in some kind of state, even though Afghans were waiting for us to leave, and according to the polls, 46% of Afghans wanted American forces out after a deal as of last January. By the way, you talk about air operations, 330% increase in civilian casualties from our air attacks between 2017 and 2020. When you were in Afghanistan, Rory, did you go talk to the families of the people we killed? I do. Did you go okay, talk well, to those? I do, let's, and I can tell okay, you one no, thing. Rory, right, Rory, just one minute, because I need to bring other people in as well. It is important to remember, as we talk often we do in the West, we lob insults at each other. You did this wrong, the United States. You did this wrong, um, Britain. You did this wrong, the Tories, Labour Party. Frankly, from what I'm hearing from my colleagues in Afghanistan, from my family in Afghanistan, we're sick of it. The deadliest year in this battle in Afghanistan was 2019 for the Afghan people. That's the year that yes. most Afghans died. So to act as though, with respect to both of you, as though this is uh, some sort of political game, as we've often heard, as a journalist myself, I've covered these stories. It's a political football that gets kicked from here to there, and the Afghan people pay in blood. Right, now, we've had a lot of hands up. Let's hear from our audience. The one at the back with the blonde hair. Yes, you at the back with the, with the glass and the blonde hair. So one of the things I wanted to ask was that you said part of the entry strategy was to fight for the emancipation of women. Yet what would you say to the 20 million people and 20 million women who've lost their rights overnight? OK, I'm just going to get around the orders a bit. Yes, the man there in the blue shirt. Uh, I, we all totally agree that what's happening right now is terrible and it wasn't inevitable. But can't we all just agree that we totally underestimated the Taliban forces in the first place? Their resilience, yes. The man in the red sweater. It seems to be at any level a, a disaster and a tragedy, but from a reputational point of view, 
America, with their allies like Great Britain, are going to police the world in the future, what, what lessons are going to be learnt before we step foot in somebody else's land and try and nation build um, in the way that we have in Iraq and Af Afghanistan? Okay. Let's just hear from the woman in the front here in the blue. Um, yeah, so just coming back on some of these points here, we supposedly entered Afghanistan with a mission to implement democracy, a Western white version of democracy. Um, I lived for a few years in the Middle East as a child, but even as a child, it was quite obvious to me that the social, cultural, historical values bring forward a very different way of society working. Um, how on earth could you take one person's values and methods into a completely different country and expect it to work, and when it doesn't, just walk away and brush your hands and go, oh, well, it didn't work anyway, let's look after our very brave soldiers and service people, and not expect there to be an enormous mess left behind. You've completely upended somebody's country, their social structure, their political structure, in some cases, their religi religious and cultural structure, and now we're just saying, oh, well, you know, anyway, it doesn't seem to be working, let's go. At some point, People have to take responsibility for that. I don't care whether it's Labour, Conservative, British, American, who it is. We've gone in, we've made a mess, we have to take responsibility to that mess. James, let me just come back to you, because a number of points have been put to you. It's a tall order to ask you to answer them all. One question in the back there, uh, the lady at the back saying she didn't think you'd answer the original question, is why have we failed on the exit strategy? I mean, Boris Johnson said today in Parliament, it's not true to say the UK government was unprepared or didn't foresee this, it was certainly part of the planning. So if this was the UK government prepared, what would have unprepared mm. looked like? Well, I think the, um, the, the, the point specifically, to answer your specific point, is that once the Doha agreement had been signed, once it was clear that the United States were gonna to work to a timetable rather than to a set of conditions, we started putting things in place. So in April, we gave uh, um, uh, Foreign Office travel advice to tell British nationals to leave Afghanistan. We set up the, uh, the ARAP scheme for interpreters and other Afghans who had worked with uh, British forces, Western but forces. But in terms of the it, scenes we've just Fiona, seen... Please, no, James, I'm just, just going to... No, please. because we, so we only April, have an hour. In Boris April, Johnson said up, today... In April, we set up the evacuations scheme... Evacuations at the airport were only prepared April, for two weeks ago. In April, we set up the scheme to allow um, uh, Afghan interpreters and, 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 and similar uh, people to leave Afghanistan. We've resettled over 3,300 people through that scheme and their families. This, this, this... This, um, the, plan to, the, the plan to deploy 16 Air Assault Brigade, which is a brigade Look, you're that being accused of not answering the question no, by our audience. This is, yeah. this well, is rhetoric. Question question is, feel that James, this is rhetoric. So no, the, no, that's not the question. No. The question is, why have we failed on the exit strategy? Do you feel no, that we haven't isn't. failed? So, so I was explaining what the exit strategy was. As I say, the timetable yes, was set by how the... How materially effective The timetables were set by the decisions the American government adhered to. You carry on talking. How materially effective has it become? Because if it was effective, we wouldn't be having this conversation today, would we? Okay. How dare you? How dare you? We, have, we, have, we the UK, the UK has repatriated a greater proportion of Afghan interpreters and support staff than any other coalition partner in the country. The solution, because we put these things in place in any other. The, the solution is not just to remove the brightest and the best of Afghanistan. And listen, the last time this happened, to your point, the last time this happened, I happened. I left the country I was born in and I came here. And I'm a proud Brit. I'm a taxpaying citizen. I try to do good. I give to charity. I work in my civil community. I vote. I do all those things. But I could have done all this where I'm from. Yes. I could have done all of this in Afghanistan. Yes. So to just remove everyone that we worked with that was the brightest and the best isn't a, a total solution. All solutions should be on the table. I'm not saying they shouldn't. But, the, you know, moving a few thousand, 5,000, that's how many we expect to bring over here over the next year. That, that, what does that number mean? Does that satisfy well, anyone Well, look, we have here? a question exactly on this, so let's hear from uh, Bethany. Bethany May Guaido. So, how many refugees should the UK accept from Afghanistan? Lisa, has Labour put a number on this? 
No, and one of the reasons that we haven't put a number on it is because it depends in part on the scale of the crisis that is about to unfold and we don't know what that is yet. So we've said that the government should make a big and generous offer. We've said they should prioritise those people who are being targeted by the Taliban so what, what already because look of look like? their, their involvement with the UK. And many of those people are in touch with us at the moment. They can't get through the roadblocks. They can't get to the airport. So even though the government is saying we'll process your visa applications, they practically can't do it. So do you and they think what the government's suggesting don't... in terms of 5,000 in the first year and then up to 20,000, does that sound realistic? Look, I just think... Is, this... that, is that a number supported I, by the I'm, re Party? I'm really glad that the government has changed tack from the weekend when they seem to be suggesting that they didn't want to offer any assistance at all That's and that, no I'm sorry that the home the home office was briefing the media that if the government offered assistance, more people would come, and that's why they were reluctant to do it. Now, the Home Secretary had a different line this morning, and I'm really glad about that. But what she is pro proposing, let's be clear about this, is um, up to 5,000 in the first year up to 5,000 people when we already know that the scale of this crisis is going to be way beyond So that I just magnitude. want to pin you down, since so the question is how many refugees not, did you get? I'm not... If you can put it on so a Fiona, number, could you at least is, say... No, Lisa, hear me out. Could you at least say whether you think the government's on the right track, no, talking about 20,000? No, no, Do you look, think it should be more than that? Look, I don't think they're on the right track for two reasons. One is that it's absolutely clear that 5,000 is too small a number over the next 12 months, and we've got to make a more generous offer than that. But the second reason I don't think this is sufficient is because what became apparent today is that there is absolutely no plan to deliver it. The Home Secretary has not picked up the phone to any of the local authorities or mayors who have offered to take refugees. The funding for this, it looks, may come from the, the, aid, the increase in the aid budget that the Foreign Secretary announced today. And what that does, and this is the problem, and this goes to your point, is if we take money out of the aid budget that we're now trying to put back into Afghanistan, having taken it out in the last few years, if we take that money out in order to support refugees here, we are pitting people who can get out of Afghanistan against people who want to stay and be supported in Afghanistan. And frankly, after the long history of involvement that the UK has and the promises that we made to the Afghan people, we ought to be able to do both. Rory, we, how, we, many, think, how many refugees should the UK so accept from Afghanistan? First, first, first fact. At the end of the Taliban period, there were four million Afghan refugees outside the country, to give you an idea of the scale of it, right? And those people mostly returned to Afghanistan when the Taliban left, which challenges this narrative coming out of Biden, and I'm afraid from other people, that somehow nothing improved in Afghanistan. Why did those people come back if nothing's improving? Second thing, too much of the debate here in Britain and the United States is focused on military interpreters. There are many, many other courageous Afghan civilians people who've worked with our charities, journalists, human rights activists, teachers, And are these doctors, people contacting you, Rory, in... to try and get out? Absolutely. My phone, and I'm sure the phone of almost everybody else here, is teeming with literally thousands of people coming in through different methods trying to get out. I mean, they are terrified. People are genuinely terrified. At the moment, you cannot get to the airport. There are Taliban checkpoints all the way to the airport. The militaries won't let you in. The Conditions set by the US and the UK are very narrow. And above all, the answer to this must be international. What the UK should Sorry. be doing is working with other partners to share the burden. More than 40 countries were involved. If we share the burden, <clears throat> we can do this. It was done for the South Vietnamese boat people. It can be done for Afghanistan. But it cannot be done by individual countries offering 5,000 a year. There's, there's a lot of talk. There's a lot of talk of nation building, and we think it's some sort of Lego system that we can pick up from, from Britain and implement in Afghanistan, like we thought with the military system, like we thought with, with, with this idea of governance or giving, forcing democracy down the throat of every Afghan, whether they want it to or not. Nation building by Afghans for Afghans is what all of you should be thinking about. Okay. Uh, Mehdi, you wanted to come in. Yeah, I do. I want to come in on the refugee issue, and I want to agree with Rory about burden sharing, especially given Pakistan, Iran have millions of Afghan refugees. Let's just remember where the majority have always been, not in the West. Um, and I would say Rory made a little dig about me not thinking things have improved. Of course, I'm not denying things haven't improved in many areas over 20 years. What I am saying is after 20 years and $2 trillion and tens of thousands of people dead, it clearly haven't improved enough. And the fact that the government collapses the moment we leave suggests... Politicians like Rory, and I think all politicians should begin any comment on Afghanistan with an apology first, and then an explanation. 
But on refugees, I would say this. There are 3,000 people, Afghans, in the UK waiting to hear about their asylum application. That's pre this crisis. Uh, what will happen to them? I assume they will get leave to remain up until Monday morning. The Home Office's official guidance said that they could, have, uh, that they, that they could be returned to Kabul safely, which I find absurd. Uh, that needs to be changed. There are hundreds of uh, quote-unquote failed asylum seekers from Afghanistan waiting to be deported to Afghanistan. The Home Office says they're on a pause. Well, that's ridiculous. Don't pause it. I would like James Cleverly tonight to give a guarantee on behalf of the government that not a single Afghan will ever be deported from the UK to a Taliban-run Afghanistan. That should be the very first premise of any discussion about refugees and asylum in the UK, the people who are already here and fearing for their lives. You've got your hand up here. Let's... Oh, sorry, sorry, I'll come around. Let me just uh, get round the audience. So regarding the preparedness of this government, when all this took place, the Foreign Secretary and the Prime Minister were on holiday, sitting on the beach. I mean, it is incredible that <laughs> that should be the case. I mean, how, how prepared were they that they felt that it was OK to go on holiday, knowing, as you say, 18 months ago, the state was coming. This was going to happen, yeah. and this should, should have been organised. And for them today, I was watching the debate in Parliament and Dominic Raab, you know, finding it amusing when people are asking him questions about this. It is absolutely so disgraceful. They should hang their heads in shame. It is disgraceful. The man there in the blue sweater. Um, the United Kingdom played a massive part in getting itself involved. For us to now be talking about only letting 5,000 people a year in is just, frankly, disgusting. We should be saying our arms are open to whoever wants to come, and then when they want a safe return, they are allowed a safe return, and we should support them in doing so. But to say 5,000 a year is, is just ridiculous. All right. The, the, the man in the stripy top. Hi. Um, the numbers... Just answer the question in my mind. The, the numbers are a joke. And the idea that 5,000 a year, uh, even if you take all of them and they came tomorrow, 20,000 that turned up tomorrow, I saw some numbers earlier today, that's one in every four villages. One person in every four villages and towns in the UK. Clearly, we can take more. And at the most simple... Um, analysis of the situation. We are a major player in the last 20 years of this situation. Therefore, we should take a major stance in the in the cleanup and in the recovery. Yeah. So we shouldn't be exactly. looking at numbers. It should be our percentage of anyone that needs the help. And that <laughs> should be probably in the tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands even. And it sounds like not only, um, especially when you take into consideration the, the numbers issued by the government today, what it's going to cost for those 20,000, which I think was less than a billion pounds, and take your perspective of the last 18 months. We can find a billion pounds, we can find 10, especially for something that is our mess over 20 years. Man in the front in the glasses. Yeah, um, I feel at least with Rory, you understand where you stand. You might not agree with it, but he's saying troops should stay. What I don't get is Labour's position on this, and I don't understand the role that you've played, Lisa, in terms of putting pressure on the government. I don't understand when I hear from you and Keir Starmer, I don't get a good feel. I haven't seen that pressure. Felt, I've seen a really impassioned, heartfelt speech in the House today mm -hmm. and no doubt here this evening. But where's that been in the last 18 months? How have you not been clear on your position and what pressure have you put on the government around the exit strategy? Well, well Lisa, th this question was put to you in the House of Commons yeah. today that, according to the Hansard website, which records every word that's spoken in, in Parliament, you have never said the words Afghan or Afghanistan in Parliament. So, given that, how have you been putting pressure on well, the Well, look, first of all, because this has largely been led by the Ministry of Defence, I'm the Shadow Foreign Secretary, not the Shadow Defence Secretary, and while we've tried to raise it, and I have tabled a number of urgent questions to try to drag the Foreign Secretary to the House of Commons in order to answer questions about this, they've never been granted. And it, it's within the government's gift how they control that. So the only time that the Foreign Secretary has ever come to the chamber in order to um, make a statement about Afghanistan, it was in relation to aid cuts. And I don't shadow the aid brief. So one of my colleagues led for it, for us on it, and led very well. My colleague, John Healy, who is the Shadow Defence Secretary, has raised this a number of times over the last few months. And I, myself, was in touch with Dominic Raab to try to get an urgent briefing over the summer, to which he didn't even bother to reply 
to the email. We've since found out why, because it okay. turned out that he was in holiday as the Taliban advanced. And I'll just say just this to you, right? Briefly, that, Lisa, because I well, need to get just, around the rest of the panel. I would just say this to you. Is don't make the mistake of thinking that just because some of us recognise that this is a complex and difficult situation that all of us need to own up to some level of responsibility for. Okay. That we... Re no, just... just, just I that have some to let the rest of the panel Yeah, in sure, but, let, but, you know, I've been directly challenged about okay. our position on but this. I, I and I let just... me just say this. We recognise that the UK was left in a difficult position when the US took the decision to withdraw, and I make no apology for recognising okay, that. You've made and, that point. You made that point earlier on. Let me come to James now. I have been working with Afghan refugees since right, I was Lisa, 26 I must let the rest years of the panel old, or and my commitment they do not to the get Afghan people share. is James, not in doubt. You, you, the, the, gauntlet was, the gauntlet was thrown down to you uh, by Mehdi to guarantee that no Afghan who's currently here uh, seeking asylum status would be deported back to Afghanistan? Well, I don't know the circumstances around the reasons why someone might have been uh, refused. Um, one, of the reasons why we, we'll... one of the reasons why we have uh, put uh, Foreign Office and uh, Home Office and uh, Ministry of Defence staff forward into Kabul is to make sure that people who would wish to do us harm are not using the current circumstance to insert themselves into the UK. It would be a perversion if we... <laughs> it would be a perversion they they wanna... if we were trying to protect Afghans in Afghanistan only to, to have those people who we know are going to be targeted. Women, in uh, uh, female journalists, female politicians, women's rights activists, female educators. We know that they are under high likelihood of being targeted for reprisals uh, um, and what we don't want to do is see that happen here on the streets of uh, the UK. So, yes, we do have to be careful. We are working at pace. We have, um, as I said, we have already put a number of mechanisms in place to, uh, to evacuate uh, people who have worked directly with us. Rory is absolutely right. Interpreters are not the only people that fall into that uh, category. And we have also now announced an additional, on top of that, an additional okay. scheme for other Afghans who we know are going to be in a vulnerable does that position my auntie? Because, does that, of, does that, because of the, does that because of the Taliban. Does that include my auntie, James, who has taught in a girls' school in Afghanistan during the last Taliban invasion and rule of the country possibly, through to now. Right, possibly. because she has no hope tonight. I, I haven't been able to get through to her in two days, and my auntie has said things publicly against the Taliban, and she will be one of the first... As soon as this a veneer of acceptability, because let's be honest, the Taliban are worried that in the next month or six weeks there will be a NATO attack. There will be some sort of land, uh, uh, there will be troops on the ground, and so they're on their best behaviour. They are absolutely abiding by all those words. It could be a front. I hope it isn't, because at the end of the day, the Afghan okay. people will win. As a refugee to this country in 1994 from Afghanistan, when this country took me in, and it did, and it gave me schooling, which it did, and it sent me through university, um, and I got a job and I worked here and as a journalist, as a woman, as a person of colour, I'm sat here talking to all you guys. This is a privilege beyond my grandmother's wildest dreams and imaginations. As a journalist, my job is to, is to report on these stories and that's what I do with the films I make and such. When we talk about refugees, often they seem like a blob. <laughs> this, this horde, this mass of people, and yet each one of us has a right to, to pursue better and to do better in our lives. Those that are deserving, and this is what we're talking about now, as though there are some that deserve it and some that don't, as though the, the Taliban are going to somehow, under a burqa, sneak their way into this country and do us harm. We need to be really careful of those kind of aspersions. So do you and think there should be no limit? I is that, that what you're saying? I think the British people need to be in control of how much. It, Immigration and refugees shouldn't be something that, that happens to us, that is done to the British people. It should be done with us. All right, let's, let's move on. I want to take another question from Sam Thomas. Sam Thomas. Uh, thank you. With high casualties, both civilian and military, millions of people displaced, trillions spent and no post-invasion stability, what was the war in Afghanistan actually for? Mehdi, I want to come to you first on this one. What was the war for? I mean... <laughs> I wasn't in favour of it. I definitely haven't been in favour of it the last 20 years, so um, I'm probably the wrong person to ask. I don't know what it was for. I know what we were told it was for. Um, and 
you know, we were told that Afghanistan was the good war, Iraq was the bad war. Um, some of us were opposed to it from the very beginning. We thought it would be a Vietnam-style quagmire. We thought that there would be uh, tens of thousands of civilian casualties. We thought that the terror threat would go up, not down. And I wish, I wish we could have been wrong about all that, but sadly, those of us who warned of those things tragically turned out to be right. So we're in that position now where 20 years later, we're kind of wondering, was it worth it? What was it for? We know that the metrics that were set down, some of them were met, some not met. We talk about, well, bin Laden was killed. Yeah, he was killed 10 years after we invaded in a whole other country. Uh, we were told the Taliban was toppled. Yes, it was. But guess who's in charge of Afghanistan today? Even more powerful, more emboldened than before. So I do think we need to ask some hard searching questions of ourselves. What was this for? What was the purpose of the war? How many lies were told to us. I mean, I would urge everyone watching to go to the Washington Post website, read the Afghanistan papers. You know, thousands of notes and memos from 400 officials, American and Afghan, talking about how they knew that this war wasn't winnable. They knew that the country was falling apart. They knew the Taliban was stronger than we were told. That's the worst part about it, to see politicians this week say, I'm shocked at this collapse. I'm shocked that it didn't work out the way. They knew, they were being told, they would discuss it amongst themselves that this Afghan army isn't up to it, that there's corruption in this government, that democracy's not working, that we're not winning. And yet they didn't tell the rest of us, a series of leaders on both sides of the Atlantic. This is a massive, massive, monumental failure. On a, you know, people talk about Iraq. This is on the same level. 20 years, thousands of lives lost, and now we're arguing about, do we take 5,000 or do we take 10,000? I mean, what we have okay. done in Afghanistan seriously deserves a, a huge accounting. So the question from Sam is uh, with high casualties, both civilian and military, uh, what was the war in Afghanistan actually for? The, the lady in the red T-shirt. Um, as someone who deployed to Afghanistan with the British military uh, in 2017 and 2018, I saw firsthand some of the benefits of us being there and some of the negatives. I think at the time we knew that we weren't there to make a radical change to the situation in Afghanistan, but I think we could all at least hold our heads up high and say that we were seeing green shoots emerging, be that women's education, be that people in Afghanistan being able to live a peaceful and secure and prosperous life. With the recent events, which I don't think have particularly come as a shock uh, to anyone, those green shoots are now stone dead. The Afghans that I supported, I've heard, have been executed in cold blood. The people that I served with and who served on previous tours, who have lost friends, brothers, sons, sisters, uh, are now seriously questioning what it was all for. And honestly, the only way that I can feel like I cannot be utterly embarrassed and humil humiliated about my service is that if we, as a democratic nation, hold those responsible to this for account and have a full parliamentary inquiry, yes. which Boris Johnson is trying to weasel out of having, trying to pretend that we don't need one, where it holds to account both some of the political decisions, but also those in the military hierarchy who are responsible for strategic and operational yeah. decisions that have led to failure. We saw this morning Nick Carter making the rounds of the breakfast television. Yeah, Brigadier Nick Carter, yeah. General Nick General, Carter General, sorry, making the rounds, um, quib quibbling whether the Taliban are even the enemy or were ever even the enemy. Um, he's someone who has um, been uh, in the top of the military hierarchy for many years. He bears responsibility for many of the failures. We as a nation need to accept that we have been defeated and the generals responsible for that need to be held to account. James, well will you assure me that people like Nick Carter will not be allowed to just retire and go and work off on the board of a private military contractor and live, you know, very well remunerated lives? will at least have a moment where they are held in very, very humble silence for the decisions that they have made. And that is the only way as a veteran that I and my fellow veterans will feel that at the very least we have learned something so that in 20 years time, uh, the next generation isn't in some other country undergoing the same process. I should say, of course, that Nick Carter is not here to to defend himself, to put his view. But, James, you've been asked the question directly. Well, uh, um, f first of all, thank you. I've been in the military for uh, a long while in the Reserve Forces. I've never served in Afghanistan, obviously. I know lots of people uh, that have. I know people who have had life-changing uh, injuries. Um, and, obviously, we, um, just as all the countries that contributed troops to Afghanistan, we've lost 
some of our brightest and, and, and best people. And that is uh, obviously a huge, a huge sadness and, uh, and something of huge regret. We will, of course, we will, of course, need to look at uh, all the phases of this operation. As I say, there's been an inquiry in terms of the uh, rationale around the uh, original uh, deployment, uh, the, that kind of mid-term mission shift from the uh, uh, suppression of terrorism through to capacity building for Afghanistan institutions and what happened in most recently in terms of our military support will, of course, be something that we, that we look at. Look, you know, I get that. Look, all now, we just need an inquiry. Just need a commitment to a full inquiry. Will you give one? Look, I'm not yeah. able to give that uh, uh, commitment here and now, but obviously there is, there is always, there is always um, uh, an after-action review. You know what that is, and that will happen. That will, of course, happen in this, and, 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 and questions will be asked of everyone involved in the decision, uh, politically, militarily, diplomatically, uh, everybody. Um, and, of course, it is absolutely understandable that, that at this particular time, when we're seeing the uh, images coming out of Afghanistan, veterans in particular will find it incredibly uh, difficult. Um, and it's completely understandable that people are frustrated, that they're angry, that they're, that they're depressed. I would, I would put a strong plug to, uh, to make sure that anyone that is feeling uh, the pressure because of this reaches out, whether it be to former colleagues or to, to, to uh, defence charities. Um, and, of course... To what, uh, and um, to what mental health service would you ask them to go to? Our mental health service is shocking. Absolutely shocking. <laughs> We, no, no, no. We, we have no. We have no. We have. Um, there are. There are. There's a very strong network, particularly of military mental health charities, uh, and 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 charities, James. And the they and they and they, they and okay. they work closely. They work closely with mental health services okay. in you the NHS. And I would encourage veterans to reach out. You, uh, you've, you've, you've been trying to come in. So, uh, in in the middle of this debate is a real, natural, political black and white thing. There are some people like Mehdi saying the whole thing was doomed from the start. It was a total catastrophe. No good came out of it. And obviously, there were people in 2007, really 2008, in 2007, 2008 who were saying the whole thing was terrifically successful, we were going to build some Switzerland and Central Asia. The truth of the matter, from my experience, is that there was a lot of improvement in terms of individual lives, not on the level of the state. The Afghan army never became self-sufficient. But I've made, Mehdi, with respect, 125 trips to Afghanistan over the last 20 years. I went into Kabul at the end of 2001. It was a ghost town. 300,000 people, nobody in the streets, 4 million refugees. We built a charity in 2006. I've got 400 employees on the ground at the moment, at risk from the Taliban, because of an entirely unnecessary and reckless decision by Biden trying to emulate President Trump. We didn't need to do it. And what we've done is we've destroyed hundreds of thousands of lives, people who were living lives similar to their opposite numbers in India people who were able to go to school, and Sorry. we were protecting it with a very small investment. And your figure, Mehdi... Rory. Your figure, which yep. you've quoted to suggest the only reason there are no casualties is because, at the beginning of 2020, a peace deal was signed, are completely misleading because you should be aware that there were only six casualties in the year before that peace deal was signed. This has been a very low-cost, low-risk operation, okay. which... On. Wait, wait, Mehdi, let me finish, since you had a long rant about how the whole thing was a catastrophe OK, but I don't want you to do a long rant right. either, Roy, okay. so because otherwise so no-one else will come in. we must get out of the black and white. Either it's a disaster or it was okay. brilliant. It was a poor, right. fragile country which was making huge progress and we could have maintained that with a very modest investment okay. and Nearly we threw it away. The question is, what was the war in Afghanistan? Mehdi, I'll, I'll come back to you. Mehdi, I'll come back to you, forgive me. And in fairness to Mehdi, he didn't say that there hadn't been any improvement. That, that, that isn't what he said. What, what was the war in Afghanistan actually for? The war in Afghanistan was fought, um, to some degree, for the children that I met, met when I was working at Newsround and I, and I got the opportunity to go back and make a film about the kids of Kabul. And I went to a place called Skaterstan and I met young girls wearing their traditional Afghan clothes, going up and down these huge uh, skate, the skate park that they had built. Because the war in Afghanistan gave a generation hope. That's what it gave. Bear with me. You can't kill hope. You can kill people. 
uh, people have died and they've lost their lives and you've all been very honourable in the way that you've expressed this in Methi in Washington DC. But those young girls are now young women and they have aspirations and they have hopes and they will fight for it. Images came out of Afghanistan yesterday of four women standing with A4 pieces of paper in a protest. These women who are going to be killed if the Taliban are what they are, are standing and protesting today in three different cities, in Khost, in Kabul, in Jalalabad, people stood and held up the national flag of Afghanistan to tear down the flag of the Taliban. What does this say? It says the Afghan people are resilient. It's that, that they are hopeful. That's what you did. And I have a confused understanding of what, what this war in my birthland has achieved. And I look to Rory and I nod, and I look to James and I nod, and then to Lisa and to Mehdi, and then I look at all of them and I'm like, what are you talking about? None of you know what you're saying. But that's what you did. You helped those four girls hold that poster up. And you helped a bunch of people hold up a national flag of a national identity. I don't want to get soppy about it because the death and the trauma and the people falling from the skies from an airplane are still real. But it's a bittersweet thing and you, mu you, must, you must hold on to that. You, you want to come back in? As you allude to, there are pockets of anti-Taliban resistance, um, whether it is for women on the street, uh, people in Jalalabad raising the flag, um, whether it is in Panjshir province. My, my question really is to those of you with political power, are we going to let them stand alone? Are we, the United Kingdom, mm -hmm. going to let them stand alone? No, and this is a really, really important point. And, and I think uh, just because... Just because uh, the situation now is tragic and because we didn't achieve everything that we wanted to achieve doesn't mean to say we achieved nothing and we did achieve a generation of young women who have had the opportunity to learn we have we have and and we do absolutely need to work to protect those gains as fragile as they are and that means working with the countries in, in the immediate uh, vicinity around afghanistan that means working with countries uh, that have a degree of influence over the Taliban, that's about making it absolutely clear okay. that we are not just going to walk away from uh, applying, mm. applying leverage and applying pressure and trying to make this situation uh, um, a, a, as good as it can be. This okay, is, let this me bring in Lisa, because Lisa's not had a chance to answer this question. So uh, the question is with high casualties, millions of people displaced, trillions spent, no post-invasion stability, what was the war in Afghanistan actually for? Of course, this is a war that Labour supported. Well, look, I think it's impossible to look at the situation that is unfolding in front of our eyes and think that this is anything other than a catastrophe. But having said that, those mistakes that have been made, the very many mistakes, including the failure to plan for what came next after our exit strategy, which we have raised repeatedly in the House of Commons and with ministers over recent months. Those failures were political and strategic. They were not the failures and mistakes of the very many people led by Afghans themselves, with British troops supporting them, with um, humanitarian and aid workers from all over the world, including Afghanistan, supporting them and here in the UK, and the very many diplomats and staff and civilian contractors who worked as well to deliver the benefits that so many panellists have talked about. The clearance of landmines, which nobody has mentioned, which gave a dramatic boost, Absolutely. not just to the safety of people in Afghanistan, but to the economic prospects yes. of people in Afghanistan as well. And I would mm. hate for anybody, particularly those of you, who, who bravely and rightly stood up for our country and stood alongside Afghans and helped to deliver those gains to come away with the sense that we are anything other than absolutely proud of those achievements and determined to do everything that we can in these most difficult of circumstances to defend them. There is a generation of young Afghans that grew up with a transformation in what they could expect from their futures. They learnt languages, they studied all over the world. They took those skills back to Afghanistan and put them to good use, making a contribution, and they got access to education. Millions of, of them, girls who never would have had it before. They're watching the future unravel in front of their eyes. We owe it to them now not to engage in a council of despair, but to think what we can do right now okay. to start to exert some leverage over the situation and protect those gains. There's one more question I want to get in from the audience. We've only got about eight or nine minutes left, so we'll have to be reasonably brief, but this is a question a lot of you asked. Uh, Matthew Goodwin Freeman. Uh, hi, everyone. As Kabul fell, the Prime Minister said that nobody wants to see Afghanistan become a breeding ground for terror. But, in truth, won't the situation in Afghanistan now mean members of the public here in the UK 
are more at risk of terrorism and extremist acts. James. Well, there is, of course, that risk. This is why the UK's position had always been that we withdrew when certain conditions had been met rather than to uh, a specific date or timeline. We are going to have to work very, very closely. We're going to have to work closely with countries in the immediate vicinity around Afghanistan, and some of those countries are countries that we have a very difficult uh, set of relationships with, including Iran, for example. But none of those countries want to see Afghanistan turn into a terrorist uh, breeding ground. Uh, it is going to be incredibly hard work, and it will require a degree of focus and attention, but we are absolutely committed to make sure that we put in that diplomatic work in Afghanistan. And you know, we are deeply, deeply suspicious of the promises made by the Taliban, both in Doha and most recently. But we will judge them on their actions rather than their words. And we will work with the countries in the region, both the immediate neighbours and those in the near vicinity, who also have a vested interest okay in Afghanistan not returning uh, to uh, uh, terrorism. I mean, the former head of MI5, Eliza Manning and Buller, has said the Taliban victory will inspire and embolden more who wish to commit jihad against the West. Rory Stewart, are we more or less secure now? No, we're, we're less secure. This is an immense victory for jihadists, coming just before the 20th anniversary of 9-11, and we gave it to them. Totally unnecessary. Light presence, and we decided to hand this enormous victory to the jihadists. Uh, President Biden believes that by leaving, he's ending the forever wars, ending the global war on terror. What he's just done is to do something similar to what happened in Syria in 2013-14. He's probably extended this war on terror by another decade through a single, unnecessary, shameful betrayal of the Afghan people. Lisa Nandy. Uh, I agree with Rory that we are far less secure than we were even on Saturday, and that is a real problem. And I was surprised today in the House of Commons when the Prime Minister made quite a lengthy statement to the House about our strategy that this only warranted two sentences in his reply. It ought to be a priority. There are two things the government should do very quickly. The first is about intelligence. The, the government appears to have been relying on intelligence up to now that said that the Taliban were unlikely to advance and that the Afghan government had the resilience to hold out. That clearly was completely and utterly wrong. We need to get a line of sight on what is happening beyond Kabul because at the moment we don't have any understanding as far as I can work out about what is happening on the ground and that means working with our partners to share intelligence and get that line of sight. But the second thing that the government ought to be doing is they ought to be exerting what limited leverage we've got on the Taliban. And this is a painful place to be. This is an unpalatable prospect and this is a difficult scenario that we don't want to be in. But unless we start going after, for example, the financial assets of the Taliban, they've taken over the Afghan government's assets. Some of those may be in UK banks. Why aren't we freezing the assets? Why aren't we working with partners to impose sanctions? Unless we start pu putting leverage on the Taliban in order to try to put pressure on them not to allow Afghanistan to descend into a haven for terrorists, we will reap the benefits start here in the, the UK map, and it will be a fall. Start start the the There's a COVID yeah. pandemic yeah. happening in Afghanistan, yeah. just like there is not in the Not the Afghan people. No, but, but, nobody but is suggesting the, the Afghan the people. By not, but nobody the, is suggesting that you should punish the Afghan people for a regime that has come to power through violent means and displaced the government that they elected. How will you be able to help them if you're going to stop all and any money going into the country? And the Taliban have barely got 10 days of money left, That's not what I was suggesting. That is absolutely not what I was suggesting. I understand your statement about not wanting to fund the Taliban. No one wants to die. Of course, nobody wants but you to. But we should However, be getting assistance directly to the Afghan people. How? The United Nations still has a presence on the ground. Because in the Afghanistan. Taliban allow it. Because the Taliban any, allow it. So if, if the children leverage, have, been trying, this, to, sorry, have Lisa, been trying to negotiate on, let, access let to let Nelly speak. Let Nelly for, Lisa Nelly, Lisa. sorry, let Nelly Fass speak. Everything should be on the table. Everything should be on the table. Ten days ago, the idea of talking to the Taliban was utterly unimaginable. Today, whether you want to do it via Qatar or whether you want to do it via the UAE, you have to directly or indirectly engage with them. But you are whether creating okay. a division okay. where none okay. exists, because actually this is one of the few areas where there is a cross-party consensus between us and the government. Right. There has been an engagement with the Taliban for quite some time. I need to let Mehdi in before the programme is over. And we must to get access to help the Afghan Mehdi, people. are we I more or agree. less safe? Yes, we are. To answer the question, we're less safe, but that's not because of the way the war ended. 
That's because of the failed war itself, 20 years of failures. Uh, James mentioned earlier, we're safe after Afghanistan. We invaded Afghanistan in 2001. The 7 7 bombings happened in 2005, four years after our invasion. Uh, terrorist groups have havens across the world Syria, Yemen, Libya, Iraq, all countries that we were militarily involved in, by the way, in some shape or form. Rory mentioned earlier only six people died in Afghanistan in 2019. He's talking about troops, US troops. 2019 was a horrific year for Afghan civilians. In the first six months of 2019, what he didn't tell you, we killed more people. The US and its allies killed more people than the Taliban, right? That is a shocking statistic. First six months, UN figures. We killed more civilians than the Taliban. That doesn't act as a recruitment sergeant for terrorist groups. That doesn't embolden terrorism, sitting in a Muslim-majority country for 20 years, killing civilians, whether intentionally or unintentionally. All that the war on terror has given us for 20 years is more war and more terror. And we need to change tack and not stick with indefinite occupations and forever war. We've got a couple of minutes left, and there's still a few hands up. The man in the glasses. Yeah. Oh, war. war is terror. I don't get this. It's the most nonsensical thing I think I've ever heard in my life. War yes. is terror. Here we are, 20 years on in this particular conflict. We could be talking about Iraq tonight. Mm -hmm. We could be talking about Libya or Syria. Mm -hmm. The reality is, as much as there may be terrorists out there, actually, the people who blew up the tube in 7-7 in 2005, they were from Leeds, where I live. The, per the person who blew himself up in Manchester was from London. They are in this country right now. The reality is that there is no one place on this earth where there is terrorism going on. It goes on all around the world. You cannot defeat an ideology from dropping bombs from 30,000 feet. Here, here. Thank you very much for your service, um, by the way, and all my friends in, in the forces. But with its thirst for a unilateral agenda change, shouldn't we be looking at our special relationship with the US and leading to these humanitarian crises all over in Syria, in Yemen, Iraq, and now in Afghanistan? And welcome now, obviously. Matthew, you asked this question. What do you think of what you've heard? The fact is that we are not looking at what is going to happen here in the UK, because the Labour's Defence Secretary said just hours ago that some of that 20,000 will be from the Taliban. So when we say that the Taliban aren't just going to put on a burqa and come over here, Labour are saying that they will. And it's children going to the Manchester Arena. It's commuters on the 7-7 buses. It's students on London Bridge, us communities who are killed, who get attacked by terrorists coming over here. And Labour's inability to put... I agree, I agree. But Labour's inability to put a stance on what it will do to protect communities here shows that you haven't changed from sitting on the fence like Jeremy Corbyn. Well, that's not okay. true. Let, let, sorry, that's Jeremy Corbyn voted against the Afghanistan Simply war. not true. We've, been, we've, we've spent the, the last couple of weeks pushing the government to try to agree a strategy to protect communities here. I am a Greater Manchester MP. We are currently going through absolute hell in Greater Manchester with the inquiry into the Manchester bombings. Please don't tell me that we don't take people's security and safety here in the UK seriously. But the gentleman behind you made a really important point, that this is not just a, a, a foreign policy issue. This okay. is not just something that people in faraway countries do okay. to people Lisa, here. I'm afraid we're this out is a homegrown time. problem, and we need to All work right. together to deal with it. I'm afraid we're out of time. We're going to have to stop it. We could go on for some time. I can see that. Having a live audience back... What a difference that makes, my goodness. But our hours up. Thank you very much to the panel for coming tonight. Mehdi, thank you very much for joining us from Washington, D.C. Very much appreciate it. We'll be back in our usual Thursday slot in a few weeks' time, so if you would like to join us, the first one is in Croydon in South London on the 16th of September. If you would want to be part of that, we would love to see you. And then after that, on the 23rd, we'll be in Cambridge. So do, do come to the Question Time website. You can follow the instructions there and you can see how to take part. It's been wonderful having live audience back on such an important subject this evening. Thank you all so much. And thank you, of course, to you at home for watching from this very special Question Time. Bye-bye.